The Retirement Cafe Podcast, episode 51, SOD 70. Shake off the stereotypes and empower yourself with Professor Samuel Gray. Retired or thinking about retirement? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the Retirement Cafe Podcast. In each episode, we bring you an important conversation with insight, tips and knowledge, all designed to help you live a fulfilling and successful life in retirement. Here's your host, Chartered Financial Planner and Accredited Later Life Advisor, Justin King. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Retirement Cafe podcast, which is brought to you by MFP Wealth Management. I'm honoured to be joined this week by leading consultant in public health and professor at Oxford University, Samir Gray. Samir has worked in public health for over 40 years, focusing on disease prevention and population ageing. He was knighted in 2005 for his services to the NHS and is known as a public health pioneer, having published a number of medical journals. In recent years, Samir's writing has taken on a more light-hearted tone with the publication of SOD 70, The Guide to Living Well. A very warm welcome to the show, Samir. Thank you very much. So, um, well, I wonder whether, you, for people who may not know you, uh, whether you could just give me a little bit about your background and, and, and about yourself. I've worked in the public health service since 1971, and population aging has been a theme all the way through that. But I've done, I've had other responsibilities. I, I set up all the screening programs, uh, colorectal cancer screening, aortic aneurysm screening, pregnancy screening. And then I've been very much involved in ensuring the public can get access to clean, clear knowledge. Mm. In the 19th century, we gave them clean, clear water. In the 21st century, got to give them clean, clear knowledge. And that gets more difficult in the age of the internet, and surprisingly. Yeah. But we set up NHS choices, which I'm sure many people have, have used. Sure, sure. So tell me about how, how did that come about? Uh, see, I, I was uh, what was called the chief knowledge officer for the NHS. Mm. And it's uh, the, 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 the person we call the patient, I don't like the word patient, is the only one who's constant in any health service. Everyone else is a shift work or part-time or nine to five. So we have to see that knowledge, clean, clear knowledge, is the enemy of disease. So if people go on and just search on the internet for epilepsy or heart disease or dementia, well, there's some good stuff there. But there's also a lot of bad stuff and wrong stuff. So we have to compete on the internet. And that's what NHS Choices was set up to do. And I think it now gets about 35 million visits a month. Wow. Wow. And that, I mean, just even keeping that updated must be quite a job. Yes, but we do spend about £5 billion a year in research. It's just that research shouldn't just finish up in fancy journals and locked libraries. We set up a means of flowing that research outputs through to the public, because often you find that the person who's called the patient, particularly if you've got an uncommon disease, you'll know more than the GP can possibly know. So mm. we have to reach out in a different way. Right. And then, but running through all of that has been an interest in what is called aging. Yes. And this, um, you know, I, well, I think the, 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 one of the most interesting things I want to talk to you about is this, uh, your, you know, your non-technical book, Sod 70, The Guide mm. to Living Well. So what, what made you want to write or decide to write this book? Well, we've also done Sod 60 and yes. um, Sod Sitting, Get Moving. It was the fourth time someone said to me, um, how does it feel to be 60? And I said to them, some young person, I said, oh, f 60, you just got to get a f***ing grip. <laughs> so I, I started a book called f 60, right. ran out of time, but finished it when I was 70 and took it to the publishers. And they said, oh, we don't like the title. <laughs> I said, oh, it'd be great if it was banned, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, no, we don't mind the F word, but we're English graduates, so they were like alliteration. So they, they, they picked a good word, I think, sod 70. Sod it, sod bad weather. You just got to get on with it, you know? Yeah. So that's the principle, because aging by itself is not a cause of major problems until the late 90s. The problems come from loss of fitness. Right. For most people, uh, people like you, are doing a very dangerous thing at the moment. You're sitting down. Yeah, you probably have been sitting for maybe fifteen years, and you've got another thirty years of sitting in front of you. And there's the car and the computer, loss of fitness, then disease, much of it preventable. But probably the the most difficult thing are the negative beliefs and attitudes that people have because they believe it's all due to aging, which is not. 
So that was the, the mission behind all the work I'm doing now and what we're calling living longer, better. Not living longer. The Times had an article saying, do you, uh, on Monday, I don't know if you saw it, uh, but living to 130. I don't meet many people who want to live to 130, really. Um, <laughs> but people want to live, as my one of my my mentors, Sir Richard Dahl, said, he wanted to die young as late as possible. And he did. Um, yeah. He was still uh, publishing scientifically in his early 90s and then died quite quickly and quite well. I think, of course, um, I think the reason people may say that they don't want to live to 130 is because they imagine living that long will be full of, you know, distress in essence of pains, mm-hmm. aches, pains, or what have you. But if you could live to 130, but were still relatively active and, and your mind was okay, then I think most people would embrace that. Yes, they might. But I think we also have a social responsibility. Um, if we all lived to 130, the planet would collapse much more quickly because that'd be... <laughs> 50 years more of healthy appetites and uh, car driving. Yeah. So the implications are huge. Absolutely. I'm not going to try and stop it. There's no there's a way to time trying to stop it, but I'm just pointing out that I don't, I don't think they'll do it anyway. So that's a, that's a comfort to me. Right. Um, I know you're, a, you're not a fan of the word retirement, but you are a fan of the word renaissance. So yeah. tell me more about that. Well, you see, the retirement, retirement age, Bismarck, picked the first retirement age of 70 in the 1880s. And he picked it knowing the expectation of life was 70. So he could say to his government, well, it's not going to cost us very much. Don't worry. <laughs> and then uh, it's, that's what happened in UK too, and then down to 65. And But in those days, I mean, 1911 was 65 and uh, 60 was in the Second World War. But in those days, the expectation of life was, was very short. But now someone aged... 60, should assume they're going to live to 90. I mean, they're not all will, no. but uh, the assumption is that people get 30 years in front of them. The, the assumption is we're going to live for 30 years and just hoping that if you do nothing, you'll pop off a nice little heart attack is a great mistake. But also what we're seeing now is that, that people are recognizing this and the old world of childhood work and retirement is now changing. I'm sure you've got friends in, in their 50s who've, you know, they've been doing the same job for 30 years, but they're just changing. They're doing something different. Yeah. And sometimes they're taking formal retirement and sometimes they're moving on. So I think we're moving into what, there's a very good book called The 100 Year Life. And I'd recommend an interview with uh, with Linda Grattan. Uh, and there's multi-phase life. So mm. the word retirement go, like, this implies the snail going back into its shell. Mm. Uh, so that's why I came up with the term renaissance, which is a bit fancy, but it, it is intended to say it's the start of something as well yeah. as being the end of something. So being 70 yourself and um, supposedly in that kind of um, retirement space, uh, mm-hmm. or renaissance space, tell me about, tell me what the future looks like for you. What, what are your plans? Well, the, the, I'm finishing off one job, handing on to other people. And uh, that's the job I've been doing uh, for the last 10 years to try to get 12 billion pounds more value out of the 120 billion we spend in the NHS mm. by, by doing less things that don't work very well. For example, I think we spend a billion years, in, a billion pounds in the last weeks of life doing more harm than good, usually by admitting people to the hospital who should be looked after at home. There's an example of things that need to be stopped and then we can shift the money to district nursing or and chiropody or other things. Right. And then the, the other mission I'm on is uh, what we're discussing now is helping people, including the medical profession, understand that aging is not a cause of major problems until the late 90s. And we have to keep people fit. And that means physical, yeah. cognitive and emotional fitness, not just doing uh, physical fitness, prevent disease, treat it well. But mostly it's encouraging people to be optimistic and positive. So that's the mission now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you, you briefly touched on a, a second ago um, about, you know, the dangers of sitting and um, you, you have called it excessive sitting syndrome. I yeah. think. Um, so how do we, how do we get the, the nation to counteract this? Well, I think it, it, there are uh, things that uh, it's a cultural change. First of all, people need to see the, the challenge that is there in modern life and the way we design cities. 
So uh, a simple example, we're looking, could we get a million people over 60 back on bikes? Mm. Uh, now, I don't know where you live, but cycling is pretty tricky in many places. Oxford and Cambridge and, and London are pretty good now. Uh, yeah. Could be better, but pretty good. Uh, whereas many cities, it's very dangerous. But we're also looking at people who are housebound and, and could we use virtual reality? And people do virtual reality cycling. I don't know how many of your listeners have tried virtual reality. But you can do amazing things. Obviously, we should try and get people out to meet others. But with virtual reality, you could, if you were, if I was tech, I could meet up with some school friends and we could virtually cycle lands into John and Groats 30 minutes a day, talking to one another as we go. So that would be the social and emotional side. And we could be doing it to raise money for cancer research. Yeah. So there'd be a purpose to what we're doing. So that's the plan. Yeah, I can see that. Um... I, I mean, I'm 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 a keen cyclist myself, and in yes. the winter in the winter months, I do use these kind of um, oh, do you? Yes. online online systems where mm. um, I'm not so much competing with other people, but I am, you know, I I, I am doing the d- doing a you know an Alp or a course or yeah, whatever, yeah. you know. It's um, wonderful, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's re- it's really good, and of course, you can test yourself and yep. try and beat your times, and um, yeah, it does make the. Uh, the act of sitting indoors, sitting on a bicycle, a little yep. bit more stimulating. Yep. Than, um, <laughs> the uh, a challenge to you and your friends in the cycling club, um, we'd be, we're going to recruit people like you to try to raise funds uh, for um, people who can't get, get to the club anymore. Yeah. And so you'd have a virtual club in wherever you live, Surrey or Sussex or whatever. And uh, you would have a virtual cycling club as well as a, a real cycling club, and you could be chatting to others as you did it. You could do that at the moment using what we're using now, namely Zoom. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'm thinking, you know, do you start removing, um, I don't know, removing seats from trains? And uh, you know, <laughs> I, yes, I said uh, I was on a bus yesterday in London, and this nice young woman offered me a seat, and I said, no, thank you very much. I'm in training. Oh, what for? She said, cycling. I said, no, my my eighties and nineties, and she rode with laughter and sat down. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great that's a great story <laughs> fantastic so you have polished you, you know you've you mentioned you published a number of books at aims of the over 60s can you you know tell tell the audience a little bit about them and why they may want to um take some time to read them yeah well the um the the, the sod 60 and sod 70 they're similar obviously but um six-year-olds are often still in work yeah. Um, 60 year olds often have parents to look after, 70 year olds less often. So it's like different. There's a difference between 60s and 70s. The, the mission there is just to explain what is happening and to give suggestions for things you can, you can do to start to adapt. For example, body maintenance. So it's like having an antique car, you know, you got to look after it a bit. And, mm. um, uh, there's also things you can do to reduce your risk of disease. And then if you've got disease, I don't think in the health service at the moment, uh, it's coming now, but at the moment, we just give pills to people who've got long-term conditions. And uh, we've developed many wonderful pills, but everybody with, say, type 2 diabetes should be given pills and an activity program. They're probably at the moment given pills on a diet sheet, but not given pills and activity program. So we're discussing with the gym industry how could they get involved in type 2 diabetes or high blood pressure? And they're, they're proving very keen to do this. So the books outline really the, the scientific basis for this. And they're written in quite an open style. But actually, they're also written for the medical profession because they're very muddled about what's happening to us as we live longer. And I say there's these four processes, aging, loss of fitness, disease, and negative beliefs and attitudes. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, you know, one, one of the things that I'd like to maybe investigate with you a little bit more is, is th- this idea of actually giving up work. I mean, it doesn't sound like you, you, you have any intention of giving up work. Um, uh, so this kind of standard, you know, I get to 60 or 65 and I get my gold clock or whatever yeah. it is. And, I, and, and, and pensions are often linked to a specific yeah, retirement sure. age. Yeah. Um, so tell me, tell me more about your thoughts around that. Yeah, well, well, I, I have formally retired from the NHS, and right. that's partly because I think there are young people who are looking for jobs. But for the last 20 years anyway, I've been doing jobs which I've created and raised money for, 
And many people, many people have a, have terrible jobs. Uh, one of my ambitions is to get Bear Grylls to commute from from Vauxhall to Barking, um, and sit nine hours in front of a computer every day. I mean, so for many people, getting out of that sort of life is very good for their health. Yeah. Uh, so I think that this is the issue. We now need to see that work is not everything in life. And uh, I say I am seeing that now with people in their 50s, even in people in very sort of creative jobs. So I say, well, I've been doing this 25 years and I enjoy it. Um, I've got a free idea of freedom, but maybe now's the time to think of something else for the next 20 years. I'm sure you've got friends in this position yourself. So sometimes the retirement age stimulates this, but we're now seeing people are making this decision before 65. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think getting something, you know, I'm I'm very passionate on on people living what I call it ideally a fulfilling life, and yes. living with something with purpose. Yep. And, it, and, it, and if you were sat there sitting there on a you know a commute with a nine hour day and thinking this is pretty rubbish, yep. I would I would encourage anyone now to kind of you know have a conversation, um, possibly with someone like me, a financial planner, who's going to go okay, let's let's look at what you know, without any obstacles, what would be a great life? Because yes, you might, you know, even at 50 or 40, you might have 40, 40 odd years. Yeah, yeah. Let's make sure that that's fantastic. Um, and, and sometimes just a different perspective can really encourage people, yes. people to, to do something different with their lives. Yeah. Um, one thing I must point out um, uh, uh, to you that I do have a stand up desk. Um, Good, yes. <laughs> so oh, I, I, yeah, uh, it, it, should, I, it, it should be compulsory and, and, you know, the, the boss should make everyone go out at lunchtime. I always say to people, even if you don't love your staff, get them out because you'll get more and better work in the afternoon. Yeah. So yeah, we I do, think there's, we do this is coming in now. Here. It's coming in. We do encourage that here. We have a Springer Spaniel in the office that, yeah, um, good. that needs walking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, Ryan, our trainee, who um, is doing a great job, I've encouraged him to have an hour off, uh, finish early on a Friday if he will actually go for a walk at lunchtime. Yes, um, good. <laughs> so there's a so he gets away early on a Friday, but also hopefully gets uh, you know we live we do live our office is next to the beach, so there's no real excuse yeah, yeah. To, uh, <laughs> to, to not enjoy it. But even if you're in a city, there's some still some. Oh yes, the cities. Are one, I always say I actually prefer city walking. I always say the the wildlife is more interesting in cities. Ah, yes, yeah. People you see. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, okay, this is a fascinating conversation. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like our listeners to, to, to take away? No, I think the key thing is uh, uh, we need to rethink what's happening to us as we live longer and to change our view of aging. Aging is a normal biological process. Mm. It is two effects. One is to reduce the maximum level of ability. So Roger Federer's pulse rate is starting to go down from about 38 on. The second is to reduce our resilience or reserve, namely how we bounce back. And that means how we cope with things like a trip or inactivity. So paradoxically, the more you're affected by aging, the more activity you need. And that's physical, cognitive, and emotional. And as you pick up long-term conditions, which may limit your mobility, the more activity you need. That's the paradox, really, that I'm promoting. So people need to think, okay, I'm 75 or I'm 78. Well, next year, I'm actually going to do something more. Yeah. And that's a new message. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's a, and a, and a clear message, and I, and I can, yeah, absolutely be an advocate for it. And, uh, um, yeah. Brilliant. That's really, really quite inspiring. And hopefully that um, we did a client story the other day about, uh, in fact, my my um, my mother-in-law is uh, 74 and she did a triathlon last weekend. Oh, did she? Great. 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 Yeah. Oh, I'd love um, to send me some information about her. Yeah. And she's, she's, she's um, not the Iron Gran, is she? No, no. We have had Iron Gran on, yeah, the, sure. uh, we, on, the, on the podcast already, yeah, yeah. who... Uh, who is you know, absolutely fascinating uh, mm. to, to talk to. But, yeah, these real client stories, of hopefully we can... Um, yeah. No, it's, it's, but it's important to think, you see, I, I had a heart attack six years ago, oh. so I can't run 60 yards. Right. Um, but it was great. The morning after my heart attack, after the stent had gone in, yeah. an exercise therapist came to see me, and it was made very clear that it was up to me. Um so in some, some parts of medicine, they're getting the message. 
but mm. not all parts of medicine. So that's part of the mission. And and how did you? Uh, what did you? Uh, your exercise regime change after that heart attack? Well, I used to go running. Um, oh. I cycle every day, and yeah. uh, I think I will get an electric bike because I can't manage the big hills in Oxford. No, but actually, uh, the electric bikes are very good. The evidence is that if you get an electric bike, you don't use any less energy. You just go further faster. Uh, oh. I mean, it's electro assist. I don't know if you've tried an electric bike, but they are. They're very good, uh, but the, you do use the same amount of energy. So that's yeah. uh, that's the plan, and uh, brisk walking, and then every morning I do 10 minutes of stretching. Every man should be able to do the same number of press-ups as their age. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so are you, are you but I couldn't do a triathlon. <laughs> well, not yet, maybe. Not yet. <laughs> well, it's been brilliant to talk to you, Samir. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, I know you're a busy man and a, a big schedule with all the things you're up to. So, um, yeah, once again, thank you for taking the time. And um, uh, where could people find out more about you and the work that you do? And Look um, up. The, uh, the website is called www.theoptimalagingprogram.net. Okay. And they'll see all this stuff there. Brilliant. Brilliant. And um, well, we'll put we'll put the links in the show notes as well uh, yeah. so that people can hit the retirementcafe.co.uk and, uh, and and hop to those links. Um, so once again, thanks for your time and um, and all the best for, with with your retirement. Uh, well, we're getting back to you about virtual cycling and getting your you're a member of a cycling club, are you? Uh, I'm not actually purely yeah. because uh, the when they go out with a young family, it's I find yeah, it sure. difficult. Yeah. I actually um, running my own business find it kind of yeah, like, sure. oh, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a break this afternoon, right? And and the yeah. sun's shining, off I go. But uh, my wife and I managed to complete an um, uh, an Ironman this week this year. Yeah, great. Um, great. So uh, so and and she's off to do some crazy marathon in a couple yeah. of weeks' time. Yeah. So we're, we're 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 hopefully we're on it. <laughs> Good. Look forward to hearing from you. All the best. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. If you'd like to find out more about Samuel Gray's work and his books, check out the show notes on our website at theretirementcafe.co.uk where you'll find some useful links. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Um, If you have, please do leave a review on iTunes by searching for the Retirement Cafe podcast or subscribe so you'll never miss an episode. You can also continue the retirement conversation with us on our Facebook page. Simply search for the Retirement Cafe or get in touch by sending me an email at hello at the retirementcafe.co.uk. This podcast is brought to you by Retirement Planning Specialists MFP Wealth Management, so thank you for their continued support. Until next time, this is Justin King helping you feel more informed in your retirement. Thank you for listening to the Retirement Cafe podcast with Justin King. To find out more, you can find us online at theretirementcafe.co.uk. 